Brain Science, the podcast that explores how recent discoveries in neuroscience are helping unravel the mystery of how our brains make us human. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell, and this is episode 156. Before I tell you about today's guest, I want to remind you that you can get complete show notes and episode transcripts at my website, brainsciencepodcast.com. You can send me feedback at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com, and you can also submit voicemail at speakpipe.com forward slash Doc Artemis. Today's guest is Dr. Russell Poldrack, the author of The New Mind Reader's what neuroimaging can and cannot reveal about our thoughts. Dr. Poldrack is a professor of psychology at Stanford University and a recognized expert in the field of functional MRI. If you are a longtime fan of brain science, you know that I am something of an fMRI skeptic. Yet, it is an inescapable fact that the use of fMRI has revolutionized our study of how the human brain works. Thus, this is an extremely timely discussion. I'll be back after the interview to highlight the key ideas and to share a few brief announcements. Russ Polderick, welcome to Brain Science. It's an honor to have you on my podcast. Thanks. It's great to be here. So obviously the goal of today's podcast is to talk about your book, The New Mind Readers, What Neuroimaging Can and Cannot Reveal About Our Thoughts. But would you mind starting out by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah. So I uh, studied psychology as an undergraduate, though I was also very interested in philosophy, and then went to graduate school in experimental psychology uh, at University of Illinois. In graduate school, I was mostly interested in studying how people learn new skills and habits. Then when I finished my PhD in 1995, I moved to Stanford to become a postdoctoral fellow there. That was right around the time that functional MRI, which is the brain imaging technique that I write about in the book, was sort of becoming uh, prominent. It had been invented around 1992, and so only a few centers were doing it. Stanford was one of them. And I didn't actually go there with the intention of doing functional MRI research, but I kind of got sucked into it. And so ended up spending four years there as a postdoc, since then moved on and had several faculty positions. I was at Harvard Medical School, and then at UCLA, and then at University of Texas, and about five years ago, moved back to Stanford. My interest in neuroscience research are primarily around how it is that we make decisions and choices, and particularly how we exert control over those choices. It kind of sort of grew out of my interest in habits because habits are so hard to control. Some of the work that we're doing is really trying to understand, you know, what's the nature of self-control? What are the brain systems that are involved in different aspects of self-control? And then we also have some sort of basic science interest in what we call brain connectivity, basically how different parts of the brain communicate with one another in people, what we can learn about that from brain imaging and how that connectivity changes over time. My lab also has a number of people working on tools and methods to help people improve their neuroscience research. So we do a bunch of work on helping people share data. And then we also develop tools to help people analyze data, particularly with the goal of helping them do more reproducible data analysis. Right, because that's really important. And it's, I know that's a topic that's hit psychology pretty hard in the last few years. So you've been at this, I mean, you've sort of been there since the beginning. And I guess you've also seen the field of psychology change significantly. Indeed. Right. So when I was first starting out, you know, very few people in psychology departments even thought that brain imaging was going to be useful for answering psychological questions. And in fact, when I was in graduate school, I sort of felt the same way. I would sort of make fun of the early imaging work, in part because it was picking the low hanging fruit is doing, you know, what happens if we make people process language in an MRI scanner? <laughs> I didn't feel like it was sort of very insightful, but fast forward to today where every psychology department has someone using this technique or similar techniques to try to understand how brain systems give rise to psychological functions. And a lot of psychology departments like ours at Stanford actually have an MRI scanner in the building, which just highlights how important it's become as a technique. So your book is really timely because if everyone is going to use this tool, 
It'd be nice if they used it wisely. What motivated you to write this book, and who is your target audience? I was sort of the right person to write the book in part because um, I was there sort of from the beginning and um, and have seen the field change over time. So I felt like I had a good vantage point to actually do it. And I played a role as sort of like a internal critic, you know, within psychology and within neuroscience of, you know, basically not just saying, hey, look what this tool can do for us, but also, hey, let's think about what this tool can really do for us and whether we're sort of, you know, over-interpreting the results. That also kind of placed me well to ask, not just to write a cheerleading book and say, hey, look how great this tool is, but also to ask in a more sober way, what has it really done for us and what can it really do? And, you know, know, where is it being oversold? In terms of the target audience, you know, it's meant for anybody who is sort of scientifically literate and interested in these questions. Um, It doesn't really assume any background knowledge about neuroscience or psychology or brain imaging and tries to kind of start from really from the beginning in terms of talking about how these methods work and what we do with them. Obviously, I've read a lot of books over the last 12 plus years that I've been doing this show, and I think it's fair to say you succeeded in that, um, in my opinion. I like the fact that you started out by discussing how our brains are different from digital computers. This is a subject that I've talked about often on this podcast, but is there something about that difference that you think is particularly relevant to understanding the role of neuroimaging? So, you know, stepping back and asking, like, what really are the differences, right? But there's a lot of ways in which they actually, you know, seem somewhat similar, but brains are much slower, brains are much messier, so they don't, you know, whereas computers are really precise, brains are messy, they get the job done because they, you know, in some ways harness the messiness. The interesting thing, you know, I talk in the book about how sort of amazing it is that functional MRI works at all. And one of the reasons that it worked is this interesting way in which the brain is organized, which in some ways is similar to how computers are organized in that, you know, a computer has different chips that do different functions. Brains have different parts that to some degree, you know, play different roles. We have parts of the brain that receive visual input. We have parts of the brain that, you know, talk to our hands and make them work. But then a lot of parts of the brain are really sort of, you know, much higher level and talking to lots of other areas. So the brain has some degree of what we call localization of function, right? There certainly are, you know, different brain parts play different roles in different functions, but at the same time, it's all connected and it's really dynamic, Right. And so that's one way in which it's different from uh, computers. The computers are, you know, sort of communicating in very specific ways between particular chips to do particular things. Whereas the brain is, you know, this big interactive dynamic system. Um, and actually, some of the work that we've been doing recently is trying to understand, you know, what are those dynamics and how are they related to, you know, different aspects of function, which is sort of a complementary way to look at how the brain works compared to saying, you know, look at what this one part does and what this other part does and then try to kind of figure out what it's doing. So we're going to focus on functional MRI. But before we do, can you talk a little bit about PET scans with an emphasis on on the features that limit their usefulness? Sure. Yeah. So PET, positron emission tomography, is a method that was developed well before functional MRI. And, you know, before fMRI, it was the method that was being used to try to understand brain function. In PET, you inject somebody with a radioactive tracer. If you're trying to look at brain activity, you would usually eject somebody either with oxygen or glucose, and then basically look at where that accumulates in the brain as people do things. The big challenge is that for PET, you know, in order to get a signal, the person has to be doing the same thing for a pretty long amount of time. So, in, you know, in the early scans, they would have somebody, for example, do a language task for a couple minutes. And then they have to sit there and wait for the radioactive tracer to wash away or decay. And then some number of minutes later, they do another scan where they have the person do something else or have them rest. And so the big problem is that the temporal resolution, kind of the window over which you can see things, is really long. You know, whereas with functional MRI, we can see things occurring certainly over seconds, you know, like a few seconds. The other main problem is that it involves in injecting people with radioactive materials, and there's only so much of that you can do. A person can only get so many PET scans in a year for research. Um, and, for example, you know, people aren't going to bring their children in for research that involves injecting them with radioactive materials. <laughs> 
As a physician, I know that the main use for the PET scan now is really for uh, looking for metastatic cancer. I mean, we use it to see whether people's cancer has spread. And and that's a situation where any risk of radiation is way outweighed by benefit. Plus, you aren't going to be doing it a bunch of times. The reason that I brought this up is because when I first started doing this show, there was a well-known figure out there who was making a lot of money, and he probably still is, doing PET scans on people and then claiming that he could help them, you know, figure out how to have healthier brains. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with I am familiar with the person, I think. And I'm not going to mention his name. But was the subtraction technique developed originally for PET scans? Or did that come later? Well, it's interesting because, you know, subtraction initially came from psychology, from the study of reaction times. This uh, Dutch psychologist named Donders kind of came up with the idea in the 19th century of, you know, if you want to understand how people, you know, engage in psychological functions, what he would do is, for example, give them two different tasks, say one with words that are really common and one with words that are really uncommon and measure how long it takes them to do the task. And then the difference between the reaction times he would attribute to whatever psychological function differed between those particular tasks or stimuli. So fast forward to the 1980s, a group of researchers, particularly Steve Peterson and uh, Mark Rakel, at Washington University in St. Louis, and Mike Posner, who was a psychologist um, working with them, basically came up with this idea of doing the same thing in PET, basically you know, having people do different tasks and then subtracting the images to see sort of what's different. The idea was that tells us you know, what brain systems are particularly related to whatever happens to differ between the tasks. So the subtraction idea really came to the fore for brain imaging in PET, but it's been around for you know, a century or so in psychology. I write in assuming that even though the analysis techniques have gotten a lot more sophisticated, this principle is still being used? Largely, yes. I mean, there certainly are some ways that one can do analyses that go beyond simple subtractions, and a lot of researchers use those these days. But, you know, a lot of the research that we and others do still relies on the subtraction technique. I guess we need to talk briefly about how MRI works and the difference between a structural and a functional MRI. Right. The short story about how an MRI scanner works is it's a big magnet. And the scanners in hospitals that people would have probably been exposed to if they got scanned for a knee injury or a headache, the strength of the magnet is usually 1.5 Tesla, which is a really strong magnet. It will pull a piece of metal out of your hand if you're within a few feet of the magnet. The scans that we use for research are generally done on more powerful machines, either three Tesla or increasingly these days, seven Tesla. So the technique is the same, but often the scanners that we're using are more powerful than the kind of standard ones that you would use for a clinical MRI scan. So when you get wheeled inside the MRI scanner, you're inside this big magnet. One thing that that does is it sort of lines up a very small proportion of the protons that are floating around in one's body. Basically, you know, you're sitting there with a very small number of your protons lined up. And then what we do, if you've had an MRI scan, you know that it's loud, right? And that the sounds that you're hearing are basically the scanner sending in energy that's trying to line up these protons in such a way that we can then look for energy that's being sent back from them and do that in such a way that we can actually figure out where it's coming from. For a structural MRI scan, so for example, we want to, you know, you have a headache and we want to see, you know, is there some sort of abnormality in one's brain? The structural MRI scan would generally look for differences in the tissue that are related to things like how much water is in the tissue, how much fat is in the tissue, things like that. And so it's structural in the sense that it's not changing really quickly over time. It's sort of telling us, what is this stuff built of? Whereas functional MRI is really trying to ask, what is the brain doing? How is it changing over time? What happens when your brain does stuff is that neurons fire and neurons talk to one another, and that's how the brain does its thing. That's how it computes the things that it computes. We would love to be able to measure that electrical activity directly, but unfortunately, there's no good way to do that with MRI. And so what we do with functional MRI is we instead measure sort of a proxy for what neurons are doing, 
which is the amount of oxygen in the blood. What we do is we look in a bunch of little cubes of brain tissue that are on the order of, say, two millimeters in each direction. So pretty tiny cubes, though they still hold hundreds of thousands or millions of neurons. And basically, we're asking how over time does the blood flow, particularly the amount of oxygen in the blood in that little piece of tissue change? It turns out, this is another one of those sort of accidents, which is sort of amazing that uh, functional MRI works at all. It turns out that when, when neurons become active, they use up a little bit of oxygen and a little bit of, of energy. They do some metabolism. The brain sends extra blood there, and that results in sort of extra oxygen to help make up for the needs of the metabolism. It turns out, for reasons that still aren't really fully understood, that the brain actually sends more oxygen than is needed, at least for the metabolic needs. So when neurons in a particular area become active, the amount of oxygen in the blood actually goes up a few seconds after the activity. It takes seconds for the vasculature to actually, and for the, you know, for the blood flow changes to actually happen because they're slow relative to the activity of the neuron. So the blood flow response that we measure with functional MRI takes usually about five seconds to actually hit its peak magnitude. And then another 10 to 20 seconds to go back to baseline. So we're measuring a proxy for what the neurons are actually doing. How did scientists prove that this was a reasonable proxy? One of the things that was done early on was to validate it with respect to other things that we already knew. So if one thing that sort of convinced a lot of people is we've known from research in animals for a long time that the visual cortex is laid out in what's called a retinotopic fashion, right? That basically if you move along the surface of the visual cortex back in the back of the brain, the part of the visual field that um, each part of the brain is sensitive to is sort of next to the other one. And they're laid out in this very systematic way such that if you move in one direction, you sort of go around the visual field. It's very systematic in terms of how the visual world maps onto the brain. A couple of early papers in the 1990s basically showed that, hey, if you put people in an MRI scanner and you show them stimuli that move around the visual field in this particular systematic way, you see that brain activity follows exactly what it should have followed given what we know from lots of other neuroscience for decades before that. So there's been a number now of those sorts of validations where you can show that the things that we kind of already knew should be the case from studies of animals where you're actually recording neurons directly, we actually see to be the case with human and functional MRI. In the last couple of years, there's been probably an even more powerful validation, which is that one can use optogenetics, which is a set of techniques for sort of, you know, directly controlling the activity of neurons with light. You can do functional MRI in animals while they're getting optogenetic stimulation and see indeed that the optogenetic stimulation drives the functional MRI signals in exactly the way that we would expect. And so that's provided another set of of validations for the technique. Okay. So I would say it's fair to say I started out as a fMRI skeptic myself. And back in 2010, I had William Utah on the show and I'm sure you're familiar with his writings, and he he calls he called I should say because he, he died several years ago, but he called fMRI the new phrenology. But he did bring up some of the challenges, and I think your book obviously focuses on on those in a very uh, concrete way. So can we start talking about the challenges that have emerged and also how they've been addressed? Bill was a really useful foil for our field. I think he raised a lot of questions that were and still are really important and then sort of underestimated. I think he finally had to, you know, I I talked a good bit with him about particularly, you know, once we started doing what people now call mind reading with fMRI, where you can decode psychological functions from brain tissue, that, you know, really made him think hard about his claims because it, you know, it really put a stake in the strong version of the claim that he had been making. One set of points that he made that I think remains a challenge for our field is 
we often don't really know what it is that we're mapping onto the brain. That We can do a really good job of saying where in the brain we think things are happening, but what those things are often is really unclear. You know, we have people do psychological tasks and we say, oh, hey, this part of the brain is involved in some process that we think this task is tapping into, but often it's not really clear exactly what it is that the task is tapping into. This is a, something we've actually been working on for a while trying to basically you know, do a better job of specifying what it is that we think psychological tasks measure. We refer to this as ontology, describing what the things are that we're mapping onto the brain. Um, we've had a project called the Cognitive Atlas for a few years now that's been trying to do this without a lot of success in the sense that I think you know, I haven't convinced a lot of my colleagues that it's as big of a problem as I think it is and as Utah thought it was. But nonetheless, I think that that's still a, a very important problem is kind of figuring out how it is that we really know that the things we're mapping onto the brain are, are the right things. I have a thought experiment that I did in a paper a few years ago that addressed this. So, you know, phrenology that he refers to, it was the science, quote unquote science, really pseudoscience in the, um, the 19th century where people would feel the bumps on someone's head and try to infer what their psychological makeup was. And, you know, we know that phrenology was problematic for a number of reasons. And we also think that the psychology that the phrenologists used, they thought that the mind was made up of these, what they call faculties, things like amative love and lots of other sort of things that none of us would think are sort of like real basic categories of the mind. You know, we think of things like memory and language and attention as sort of the fundamental parts of the mind now. So I did a thought experiment where I said, what would have happened if the phrenologists got their hands on fMRI? <laughs> you know, what would they have done? And, and I went through and basically said, well, if I was a phrenologist, I might look at the current fMRI literature and say, hey, um, these different papers provide evidence for where in the brain my faculty of interest lives. So if you're, a, if you're somebody who's interested in the faculty of suavity, right, you might find some kind of paper that you think isolates processes related to suavity. And I basically showed that, you know, if you were a clever phrenologist, you could easily come up with functional MRI studies that are published that you could claim provide support for the neural basis of your, whatever your faculty of interest is. And the, the point to take away from that is that, you know, just because we see stuff that lights up in the brain when people do our task doesn't necessarily mean that our interpretation of that is the right interpretation. Right. And that comes down to some of these commercial applications, too, which we can get to later. This month's sponsor is Text Expander, which is one of my absolutely most favorite apps that I use on my Mac. But the good news is it's now also available for Windows. And basically what it does is it creates snippets that you can use to take the place of typing out all kinds of different things. You can make fill-ins, you can do signatures, you can do form letters, just about anything you can think of that involves repetitive typing, you can do using Text Expander. And if you love Text Expander already, they also have an affiliate program. All you got to do is visit textexpander.com forward slash podcast to get 20% off your first year. Please be sure to tell them that you heard about it on Brain Science. One thing that I don't remember Bill talking about that I think is really important that you emphasize in your book from the beginning is the concept of reverse inference. Would you explain that? Often when you see brain imaging being presented in the press, this is the kind of thinking that underlies it. So, so let's say that there's a brain area that we know to be um, activated when somebody experiences fear. So like the, the amygdala, if you show people fearful faces, the amygdala is very reliably um, activated. So now let's say that I do something else and I see that the amygdala is activated. Reverse inference is basically flipping the evidence, right? So the original evidence was if the person experiences fear, then the amygdala is active. Reverse inference flips that and says, well, 
if the amygdala is active, then the person must be experiencing fear. And that's sort of a logical fallacy, right? It's only really going to be true if and only if the person experiences fear, then the amygdala is active. It turns out that there's many things that activate the amygdala. You don't have to be experiencing fear to activate the amygdala. And thus, just because the amygdala is active doesn't mean that the person is experiencing fear. So I wrote a paper in 2006 that laid out the critique of reverse inference um, and laid out another way to think about it. Because, I mean, it could be the case that, you know, when the amygdala is active, fear is probably more likely than a lot of other things that are never associated with the amygdala. And so I laid out a way of thinking about that in terms of a particular type of analysis that we call Bayesian analysis. But that's the general idea. So, for example, there was this op-ed in the New York Times uh, back in 2007 that we ended up writing a letter to the editor about that showed people videos of various presidential candidates. This was during the presidential primaries. And then tried to basically infer how the voters were feeling based on what parts of the brain were active. If there was activity in, you know, a particular part of the brain that's involved in empathy, they might, they would say that, you know, voters are feeling empathetic towards this candidate and so on. That's one of the ways in which we've seen this kind of potentially invalid inference be used. So it's kind of a subset of correlation does not equal causation. It's a similar idea, though. I think it's different in the sense that it's we don't have to invoke causality at all. It's really, you know, just in terms of how you interpret the correlations. So it's even in some ways more basic than the the correlation causality confusion and saying that you don't even have to think about causality. It's really just basically saying if you see, you know, if you see a a relationship in one direction doesn't really tell you that you can infer that there's something in the other direction. Okay. So let's talk about the question of modularity versus patterns of activity. Right. So, you know, early in in neuroimaging, most of the work focused on localizing activity. So one of the terms that is used, like there's a, a, you know, there's a conference, still one of the biggest conferences of brain imaging called Organization for Human Brain Mapping. So the idea is, you know, we want to map out what each part of the brain does. So you can put a label on it, kind of like the phrenologist put a label on, on the skull. And that's actually what I think led to a lot of this initial pushback about the new phrenology. So if you do the experiments and you look for, you know, regions that are more active for one thing versus the other, you certainly see them. You're right. You know, if I have you do a language task, I can predict pretty well, you know, what parts of the brain are going to be more active when you're doing that task versus doing some task that doesn't involve language. And so that led people to, you know, tell pretty strong stories about what particular parts of the brain did. For example, one of the cases I talk about in the book, there was work in the 1990s that basically showed that there's a part of the brain on the bottom of the temporal lobe in this part called the fusiform gyrus that seems to be more active for faces than for other types of stimuli. So if I show people faces, almost everybody will have a region in their fusiform gyrus that's more active for looking when you're looking at faces versus when you're looking at other types of objects. Nancy Kamwish and her colleagues from MIT did a bunch of work on this and, and called it the fusiform face area, with the implication being that it does face processing and it doesn't really do much else. So then the question is, is that really the seat for face processing? Is it just doing face processing? And so a number of people around 2000 started developing other ways to look at the data, particularly Jim Haxby, who is now at Dartmouth, came up with this set of ideas where he basically said, well, instead of looking at what areas are more active when people look at faces than when they don't look at faces, if we take just the entire pattern of brain activity in that part of the brain, kind of the the temporal lobe more broadly, can we predict whether somebody is looking at a face versus a house or a chair or a cat or many other types of things just based on their brain activity? The term people now use is decode. Can we decode what you're looking at just from looking at your brain? And he showed in this sort of really famous paper in 2000 that the answer is yes, that he could decode with really high accuracy whether you're looking at a face versus a house versus a chair versus a bottle and so on. And interestingly, he could decode that even if he didn't look at the part of the brain that 
was most responsive to faces. So he left out the fusiform face area and only looked at the parts of the brain that were responsive to other types of stuff. But he still saw that he could tell the difference between faces and other types of stimuli, even in those other areas. So they still know about faces, even though they're not responding as much to faces as they do to necessarily to other things. So, so that led to a ton of work in the last couple of decades now that's really focused on understanding patterns of activity and, you know, more recently bringing to bear tools from the field of machine learning to try to do fancier versions of decoding for brain activity. But that's, that's sort of the, the basic idea. So to keep on this fusiform face area a little bit longer, can you tell us kind of how that story evolved? Yeah, I think it's a story that's sort of still evolving. You know, Haxby presented his work. There was some degree of pushback from the people who, like Cambridge, who took a more modular view. But my feeling is that most of the people in the field now sort of buy the idea that the representation of things like faces is relatively distributed. It's not saying that there's not regions in the brain that are much more responsive to faces and that are actually necessary for processing faces. So there's some nice work actually from my colleagues here at Stanford, Yosef Parvizi and Colony Grill Spector, where they work with people who are about to undergo surgery for epilepsy. And so they have actually have electrodes implanted in their brain they did functional MRI before the electrodes were there to basically see what parts of the brain are responsive to faces. So they basically found the fusiform face area. And then this person ended up having an electrode implanted that was right over the fusiform face area. And they show that when you stimulate, they actually have an amazing video that went with the paper where they stimulate, they electrically stimulate this area while the person's just sitting there. And they say, what do you see? And he says, wow, your face just melted. <laughs> so they can show that, you know, stimulating exactly this part of the brain that was active in functional MRI leads to changes in the ability to process faces and didn't really affect the person's ability to process other types of, of information. So we all now kind of understand that there's this complex mixture of some degree of modularity, but then a lot of integration across different parts of the brain as well. Yeah, I was thinking of the people who've done the work that seems to indicate that maybe this area is more about expertise. Right, yeah. So there was some work by Isabel Gautier, you know, a few years after the initial findings that had looked at people with, so basically had made the claim that, yeah, it's not about faces per se. It's about things that you are expert in processing, particularly when you process it, what you call a subordinate level. So rather than just saying, oh, that's a face versus a squirrel, you say, oh, that's Bill versus Joe, right? So you're processing individual exemplars of the category and distinguishing them, which we do with faces. But people who are bird watchers do that with birds, right? They distinguish different species of birds. People who are car experts would distinguish between like, you know, a 57 Chevy versus a 58 Chevy. She found experts in cars and birds and basically looked at whether they also showed greater activity for their expert categories in the fusiform face area. And the answer from that study was yes. That study hasn't really been followed up on in a way that I think other people like uh, Canwisher sort of criticized it for particular for reasons that were kind of technical. So I think the jury is still a little bit out. It's clear that you know one of the things that's special about faces is the degree of expertise we have with them and the way that we process them compared to other stimuli. I think that probably is part of the story. As we're talking just a little bit longer about the problems and criticisms, could you tell us a little bit about Edward Vool's famous paper and how it's impacted your field? Because this is something that Utah obviously talked about. So I know my listeners will be f sort of familiar with it. Yeah. So this paper came out, you know, I saw it in a preprint version, I think around 2008. The paper was originally titled Voodoo Correlations in Social Neuroscience. And it critiqued something that a lot of papers did back then. Not very many papers do anymore, which is they would look across the brain. They wanted to find a correlation between some kind of brain activity feature and some sort of personality feature or some kind of behavioral measure that differs across people. So let's say that, you know, I want to know 
whether there's any parts of the brain that are related to, you know, how risky a person is in their behavior. So I get a bunch of people, I do a scan. And, you know, when we do the scan, we're looking across usually hundreds of thousands of places in the brain. Then I would say, you know, I would do some kind of statistical test at each of those regions. Then what the paper would do is like find the strongest correlation across the whole brain and put that in their paper. So they might have a correlation of 0.9, which is almost a perfect correlation between brain and behavior. And there were a number of papers, if you look back, it was commonly done in social neuroscience. And that's why full focused on that, but other areas have done it as well. We had actually done it in papers. And I talk about that in the book, papers around sort of decision making. And so, you know, once I read the paper, it was clear to me that, wow, you know, we've really been screwing this up. (laughs) Once you hear the point, it's such an obvious point. And the point is basically that if you do a bunch of tests and take the best result over all those tests, that best result is in part best because of random noise. And in fact, I've shown, you know, I have an example in a paper a few years ago where you can just take random data from, say, 200,000 spots in the world and do kind of the analyses that were standard circa 1990s, mid-1990s, And you can find really beautiful results, beautiful correlations between brain and behavior when it's all just based on random data. And that's because you're capitalizing on the fact that you're doing a lot of tests and occasionally something's going to just randomly look a lot like your variable of interest. So when we saw that paper, I started kind of shaking in my boots and we went back and started reanalyzing one particular study we'd published in Science a couple of years earlier that uh, had done exactly this voodoo correlation thing. And we convinced ourselves that the claims that we had made were still held up. But it's also clear that the evidence got weaker when we didn't do the voodoo correlation, when we did it in a more appropriate way. But I, you know, I think more generally, that paper kind of shocked me into thinking that we really needed to pay a lot more attention to our methods. That's in part one of the first things that really drove me to start thinking about, you know, a lot of these more methodological issues and how we analyze data. Within a couple of years from that, I think his paper was published in 2009, and that was kind of right when the whole replication crisis started to come to a fore in psychology. And so those things together, you know, I think have really driven me to spend much of the last decade worrying a lot more about reproducibility and you know how we actually do our science and worrying a little bit less about actually asking scientific questions because i feel like if we don't ask them properly we probably shouldn't be asking them at all brain science is independently produced and it relies on support from listeners like you via premium subscriptions, Patreon, and direct donations. You can learn more about how to support Brain Science by going to brainsciencepodcast.com forward slash donations. And I remember Dr. Utah talked about what he called double dipping, but Let me check my understanding, because I think it's the same thing that Vu was talking about, that you and your book call non-interdependence, where you've got a set of data and you make a theory from that data, and then you show that it predicts your data. That's that's exactly right. Yeah, the (laughs) double dipping and, and voodoo correlation are basically exactly the same thing. So how do you avoid that? There's a number of ways to deal with it. One general way is to... um, you know, to always hold out some data to test things on. So let's say that you wanted to, you know, understand this relationship between intelligence and some particular feature in the brain. The double dipping approach would be to take 100 people, look at the correlation, and then show the correlation that happens that you found that was like the strongest one. Another thing you could do is do it on 100 people, but then actually test it on another 100 people. So take that same area that your initial data showed to have the relationship and see if it holds up, if it replicates in an independent data set. And if you do that, then that shouldn't be reliant on any double dipping because it's independent data sets. One of the ways that we often do that, if we don't have it, we can't hold out a whole other data set. There's a method from machine learning called cross-validation where you, like if you have 100 subjects, you might take 90 of them do your analysis and then predict on 
the 10 that were left out. And then you basically do that leaving out each 10. That's a common technique that people use these days. And that makes a lot of sense to me that that would be a way to get more reliable. Mm -hmm. But it takes advantage of the fact that we've got much better computing power than people had when they started. Uh, That's right. So if I understand, I want to try to summarize what we've talked about. New approaches acknowledge things like the problem of small sample size, which we really haven't addressed, and also avoiding this double dipping by testing the predictions on separate data, even if it's separate data that was collected during the same experiment, but it's been held out. Yeah. And I think that the field is largely bought into the need to address these issues. You know, you rarely see you know, this sort of double dipping happening these days. And so I think that's good. And I think, you know, there's other issues that have come up. For example, there's the famous uh, dead salmon (laughs) experiment, you know, where somebody put a dead salmon in a scanner and scanned it doing a task and showed, hey, if you analyze the data incorrectly, you can see that there's activation in the dead salmon's brain. They did that basically as a way to make the point that, hey, you need to, when you're doing lots of statistical tests, you need to correct for those tests. So people now usually correct for those tests, though we've learned in the last few years that even some of the ways that the statisticians thought were appropriate turn out to not necessarily be appropriate. And we now have a better idea for you know, what the most appropriate methods are. So the field is still evolving in you know, how we think about the right way to do some of these things. So I want to talk about the newer developments in the field. Are there any other criticisms or problems that we need to address first? You know, most fundamentally, we need to address this question that came up earlier of like, what are the things that we're mapping onto the brain? There's lots of technical issues around, for example, when somebody's in an MRI scanner, if they even move their head a tiny bit, it can have huge impact on the signal. And one of the things we've learned in the last decade is there's a new way that people since around 2000 have focused on looking at brain function, which is called resting functional MRI, where you basically put somebody in an MRI scanner, have them sit there and just daydream or do whatever they want to do for, say, 10 minutes. And then you look at correlations between different parts of the brain to try to understand how the brain is communicating. And this has become a huge deal. There's, you know, a ton of work has been done to look at how correlations between different regions are related to different psychological functions or might change as people engage in different functions. It turns out that if somebody moves their head during one of those resting MRI scans, it can have really big impact, as can other things like just taking a big breath, can have really big impact on the signal. And if the data aren't processed properly, you can be misled about relationships in the data that might be due completely to artifacts like breathing or head motion. We're largely, I think, figuring out how to deal with those things now, though there's still a lot of uh, debate about what exactly the right way to do it is. But 10 years ago, nobody realized that those were problems. But you know, that's another thing that, that I think has become a big deal recently. One of the things I found really fascinating in your book was the discussion of decoding, which you have alluded to a little bit at the beginning in Jim Haxby's work. So could you uh, tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, the basic idea is to just ask, what can you read off of a person's brain activity? And that field has come a huge way in the last couple decades since Haxby's early work. We started doing work around 10 years ago where we looked at if we have people do one of some number of tasks, let's say, you know, I'm going to have you read words versus, you know, making monetary decisions versus some other set of tasks. Can we tell what task a person is doing when we've never seen their brain before, right? Because one of the, the early work was always taking some data from a person's brain and then using those data to, to decode other data from the same person's brain. But when we think about the kinds of things that we'd really like to decode out in the world, say you want to do lie detection in the world, you really need to be able to take your decoder that was created from one set of people and now apply it to a different person. So it needs to generalize to different people. So we we looked early on as to whether this kind of decoding of which task are you doing can extend to other people. And we showed that it could. We could do, I think in that study, we got about 80% accuracy deciding which of eight tasks they were doing. So if we were just guessing, we'd get about 12% accuracy. So we're well above what we get by guessing. And there, a lot of that sort of work has been done 
going forward, some of it in the context of, you know, actually trying to do useful things like brain computer interfaces. Like, you know, if somebody can't communicate, can they use uh, brain imaging to communicate? Um, actually one really interesting use has been in the context of brain injury where Adrian Owen and his colleagues started doing this and a number of other people are doing it now where, um, you can put somebody who is, you know, apparently in a vegetative state, totally uncommunicative, put them in an MRI scanner, give them instructions to try to answer some questions by imagining different things. So sort of imagine, for example, walking around your house versus imagining playing tennis. And when a healthy person imagines those two different things, different sets of brain areas become active. With healthy people, you can decode really accurately, basically, whether they're thinking about playing tennis versus walking around their house. Now you take a person who is supposedly in a vegetative state and tell them to do the same thing. And a small proportion of these people who are thought to be basically unconscious turn out to actually be able to think, to sort of answer these questions by basically engaging in particular types of thought. So that's a way that I think is going to you know, have sort of really interesting uh, implications for how we think about people who are in these you know, sort of unconscious states. Most recently, some of this work has taken advantage of the newest tools in machine learning to show that you, know, you can really start to almost reconstruct what's in the mind's eye. So you know, we can show people pictures or videos and then actually reconstruct their experience just from their brain activity. You know, it works somewhat well for visual types of stimuli. It doesn't work as well for decoding what words a person is thinking about. We can decode, for example, you know, are they thinking about fruits versus tools or something like that, but we can't. In general, it's hard with fMRI to decode kind of the specific words that a person is thinking about. But those are the kind of places where decoding is going. Yeah, I, I can see why decoding what a person was imagining in terms of what it looks like would be easier in the sense that isn't that a part of the brain that seems to be more similar from person to person, whereas the more abstract the thing gets, the more individual it probably is in our brain. Yeah, that's certainly true. Actually, most of the work I'm talking about has been done within individuals. So very, you know, some of it can be extended to other individuals, but a lot of the visual decoding, even for the parts of the brain that are pretty similar across people, it really only works if you have training and test data from the same person because it's relying a lot of, on, on a lot of the fine-grained details, and those are going to differ from person to person. So before we talk about what is going on outside of research, would you tell us a little bit about your My Connectome study? There's various ways to, to describe how I came to doing this study. There was an artist who we had as an artist in residence as our, at our imaging center, and she, her name's Laurie Frick, and she was um, really into the quantified self movement. And her art is all based on data that she collected about herself. And so we were hanging around, you know, talking about what I, what I do, and she started telling me, it's like, you know, you've got a scanner down in the basement. Why aren't you getting in there and collecting data about yourself? And so I started thinking about, like, you know, what would I do? You know, this sounds kooky. Why would I do this? And then a paper came out, I think it came out in 2012, from uh, Mike Snyder, who's a geneticist at Stanford, where he had done something similar on himself, basically taking blood regularly and then doing lots of analyses on his blood. The paper came out of the journal Cell, which is like the top biology journal on Earth. So it, that paper was kind of an inspiration for me to think, hey, look, real scientists can do real, useful, interesting research with deep data from themselves. And the thing is, you know, there's no way I could go get this much data from any individual. I was particularly interested in the resting fMRI part because I had been a skeptic about resting fMRI early on, and I really wanted to have enough data to see how reliable it is, you know, within a person. And so I started talking to, to a bunch of people and getting ideas about what to do and ended up starting, I think I started in September of 2012. And it went on for about a year and a half. And I ended in the spring of 2014, just before I moved to Stanford a few months later. So how many scans of yourself did you make? So far, so I've still, I've gotten back in a couple more times since the study ended. I think in total, I've been scanned 107 times. The study at the University of Texas, where I collected all the data, that involved 104 scans. Then I had to fly to Washington University in St. Louis and basically spend much of a day in an MRI scanner 
because we had submitted a paper about the study and the reviewers came back with some questions that we could really only answer by scanning me on the scanner in St. Louis. And so I had to go back, go out and sit in that scanner for many hours in a day. What is the most important implication that came out of this so far as far as how it applies in the field? What was the biggest thing you learned? There's probably two big takeaways. One is that with enough data, the patterns of brain connectivity that you see with functional MRI, with resting functional MRI, are incredibly stable. Nobody had this much data on an individual. Um, So this data set has been a test bed to really show that a lot of these features that people have been looking at with much smaller samples are actually highly reliable. The thing that I think hasn't been followed up, but I think is really important, and one of the things that drove me to think about the study in the first place is that if you look at how brain connectivity changes from day to day, so it is largely stable, but it also, you know, there are small changes from day to day. Those day to day changes are actually very different from how one person differs from another. And that's that's important because people have become increasingly interested in how the brain is dysfunctional in people with psychiatric disorders. And if you look at what happens in psychiatric disorders, brain function is incredibly variable from day to day. Somebody who has uh, schizophrenia can go from being totally disabled to almost fully functional in the course of a couple of weeks. And in neuroscience, we basically have no way to understand those kind of changes in brain function, in part because we never had a baseline for what brain function looks like over time in a healthy person. So that basically, those data and the finding that, you know, the differences within a person over time are very different from the differences between people basically says, we need to go in and collect a lot more data from individuals over time if we want to understand these things. And a number of other laboratories jumped on this and are are doing much denser studying of individuals. Um, And so we're starting to see those papers come out now, which is, which is pretty heartening because I think, you know, this, my paper was an inspiration for all of that work. So almost everyone, well, maybe that's not fair, but I think a lot of us have heard about the attempts to submit fMRI information as if it was a lie detector. Uh, And you give a real good overview of how that came about and where it stands. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So clearly, if we we could have a way to detect lies, it would be really useful. And so people, you know, once these ideas about brain decoding came about, people started trying to do experiments to say, can we decode whether someone is lying? And the way they do that is they would bring in our usual research subjects, put them in a scanner, have them lie, and then see whether we can detect the difference between when they're lying and when they're not lying. And that largely works. We can, with pretty good accuracy, tell is the undergraduate in the scanner lying about the thing that they were told to steal or, you know, whatever else you might tell them to lie about. Those data were kind of floating around. A couple of different groups of researchers went and started companies that tried to commercialize these results. And there have been a couple of cases that have gotten you know, good notoriety around the attempted use of, of fMRI for lie detection. One was a court case some number of years ago that I talk about in the book where this company called CFOS uh, scanned an individual and then tried to bring the data to bear. In a, um, it was actually a criminal case trying to argue that it helped demonstrate their innocence. There was a a hearing held, sort of one of the the hearings that has to be held whenever new scientific evidence is brought to bear in a in a federal court. You know, a number of experts testified, and the data were actually disallowed, um, and that sort of stood as a precedent for the courts that related to that court. There have been other cases that have had their own hearings. There was one sort of well known one that um, Dr. Oz took up as a a cause celeb, and uh, it was also disallowed there. For me, the biggest issue is whether you can ever really validate a tool for application in real criminal cases, right? Because even if you can show that it works perfectly in you know, people off the street coming in on the scanner and lying, the situation in a criminal case is so different, right? That one, the person is highly motivated to show their side of the story. Two, if it's a the kind of trial where this sort of evidence would be brought to bear, 
it's a lie they've been rehearsing for a long time and they may have even started to believe themselves. Then it becomes a question of, does it really count as a lie if you believe it? But then there's also the, the question of whether, you know, some people who are committing crimes like murder are presumably more likely to have psychological features like psychopathy. And, you know, it's likely that psychopaths probably don't show the same brain response to lying as non-psychopaths do. So there's a lot of reasons to think that you're never going to be able to validate it in the way that something needs to be validated in order to be accepted into the courts. Right. So I know you're getting tight for time, so I just want to ask you one last question. It's the question that I ask almost every guest, and that is, what advice do you have for students that are interested in getting into this field? I think the main thing I would say is really focus on getting as much training as you can in technical subjects early on. Becoming a researcher in this field requires you know, expertise in a ton of different areas, right? You need to know psychology, you need to know neuroscience, you need to know physics in order to understand how the scanner works, you need to know a ton of computing to be able to analyze the data. And increasingly, you need to be able to understand, you know, really complex statistical tools. Um, and, you know, for me, the thing that usually stops people from progressing is, you know, they show up at graduate school and they don't know their way around a computer and don't know statistics, can't work with data. Those are really the foundational things that I think are most important for people to learn as early as they can. The other stuff can sort of come along as you go. That makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, sometimes I will get emails from people who have backgrounds in, say, engineering. They're worried that they can't find a place, and I try to tell them that, really, you're starting from a good place because you can add the other stuff a lot easier than you can build that foundation of understanding those kind of technical principles. Yeah, that's exactly right how to use statistics correctly, how to understand things like noise, <laughs> which is really important in your field. Indeed. Okay, well, it's been fantastic getting to talk with you. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we close? Uh, no, I think it's been really fun. I, I appreciate the opportunity. I'm very grateful that Dr. Russell Poldrack took the time to talk with us. Given how important fMRI has become both to neuroscience and psychology, it is vital that we all have a solid grasp on what it can and cannot do. You don't have to understand all the statistics, but if you understand a few basic principles, you won't fall prey to overblown claims, including those coming from con artists and quacks. That's why I want to review a few of the key ideas from our conversation and expand on why fMRI is not ready to be used as a lie detector. Two of the topics we discussed were reverse inference and cross-validation. Reverse inference is probably the most important since it crops up all the time in mainstream media coverage. This is the idea that one can infer what a person is experiencing or feeling by looking at their fMRI. The key thing to remember here is that most areas of the brain will light up under a wide variety of conditions. The amygdala doesn't just light up during fear, and the insula doesn't just light up during disgust. So you can't conclude that a person is experiencing fear, or disgust based on these areas lighting up. Another important principle is cross-validation, which is the principle that any theory that's generated by data analysis has to be tested or validated using separate data, even if the data was generated during the same experiment. This avoids the problem William Utah called double-dipping. If you want to hear my original interview with Dr. Utah, it's available for free as episode 132, which is the encore version of his interview that I played after he died in 2017. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Another important principle that we barely touched on was the importance of sample size. Many early fMRI studies relied on very small sample sizes, which was inherently problematic. 
That's the reason why researchers are now hard at work creating large databases that are freely shared. As we've heard from many previous guests, our current understanding of how the brain works has moved beyond a simple modular structure to realizing that many parts of the brain participate in multiple activities. This has changed the way the data from fMRI is being analyzed. No one is asking anymore, what part of the brain lights up when you do X or Y? Instead, they're looking at patterns of activity across the entire brain. There are many interesting research questions that center on how the brain changes over time, both in individuals and in populations. One thing that these efforts have in common is the generation of huge amounts of data that require extremely sophisticated statistical methods of analysis. Unfortunately, this also makes it easy to exaggerate one's conclusions. And as Dr. Poltrak pointed out, this can happen even when one is attempting to remain scrupulously honest. This highlights the importance of sharing data and the importance of replication of new findings. Finally, I'd like to return to the issue of the use of the fMRI as a lie detector. First, let me remind you that the traditional polygraph is very unreliable from a scientific standpoint, which is why it's no longer used in court cases, even though it continues to be used in other contexts. One cool thing I learned from reading this book is that in 1993, the U.S. Supreme Court actually set out some very reasonable criteria for the admission of scientific evidence. I'm going to quote an excerpt from the 1993 Supreme Court case that is on 106 of the book. It basically outlines the set of criteria that must be met in order for evidence to be admitted. Justice Harry Blackmun wrote, the trial judge must make a preliminary assessment of whether the testimony's underlying reasoning or methodology is scientifically valid and properly can be applied to the facts at issue. Many considerations will bear on the inquiry, including whether the theory or technique in question can be and has been tested, whether it has been subjected to peer review and publication, its known or potential error rate, and the existence and maintenance of standards controlling its operation, and whether it has attracted widespread acceptance within a relevant scientific community. The scientific community had largely concluded that the polygraph was not accurate. So the parts that the Supreme Court has set as criteria are the theory has to have been tested, it needs to be subjected to peer review and publication, have an error rate of some sort, and have widespread acceptance in the relevant scientific community. As I noted, the polygraph fails many of these criteria, and so does using the fMRI as a lie detector. There were two different scientists that patented techniques and they did it so that they could make money with their lie detector test. One of these led to a test case in which it was ruled that the criteria were not met, and the pioneers in the field all agreed that it was not ready for use in this way. Even so, there have been a couple of celebrities. He mentioned Dr. Oz, and there was another one whose name, if even if I could pronounce it, I would not say it because I don't want to promote bogus science, but these guys basically were touting this even though it does not fit up to scientific criteria. The moral here is beware of celebrities that are touting claims that don't stand up to scientific scrutiny. In the case of the other guy that's not Dr. Oz, he actually has on his website a bunch of claims that are actually false about the scientific evidence. He basically says that it's been proven when it hasn't, so don't trust that kind of stuff. Dr. Poldrack tried to contact um, this guy because his website was actually down at one point, and he was too busy. Quote, I've been working on human age reversal, so I'm a bit swamped. 
That was his reason for not fixing his website. So again, the bottom line is if some celebrity claims that something's been proven by science, don't take that at face value, even if they have credentials. If you're interested in learning more about how fMRI works or its history, I highly recommend Dr. Boldrack's book, The New Mind Readers, What Neuroanatomy Can and Cannot Reveal About Our Thoughts. It's a pretty easy but very interesting read. And don't forget you can get complete show notes and episode transcripts for this episode and every other episode of Brain Science at brainsciencepodcast.com. You can send me feedback at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com, voice feedback at speakpipe.com forward slash Doc Artemis, or you can post to our Brain Science Podcast fan page on Facebook. And don't forget to send me a screenshot of your iTunes review so that I can send you an Amazon gift certificate. Thanks again for listening. I'll be back next month with a new episode of Brain Science. But in the meantime, I hope you'll check out my other podcasts, Books and Ideas, and Grain Rainbows. Brain Science is a copyright 2019 to Virginia Campbell, MD. You can copy this episode to share it with others, but for any other uses or derivatives, please contact me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. The new theme music for the Brain Science Podcast is Mindfire by Tony Catraccia. You can find his work at syncopationnow.com.